Thank you. What you see over here is a, a bridge near Zwolle. It's about uh, four, three years old. And I'm a bridge engineer. Um, and I would never have built a bridge like this. Um, it's designed uh, by an architect and built by an engineer. Two worlds came together, and I think that's what I'm talking about. We have made two worlds. Uh, and something beautiful came out, I believe. But this is not a story. I don't want to sell the model of, mod of, of ProRail. I just want to share our experiences. And um, what I see is that the developments in Europe, they are all depending on the circumstances. When you look to railway people, I have been all over the world and also in France. And the best railway people are in France. Engineer. Engineers, really. Um, we, we have learned a lot from them and they have a lot of information, a lot of knowledge. We have less, but we use it perhaps in another way. <laughs> this is me, married five children, civil engineer. I, um, I have seen all parts of our company. I started as a bridge engineer. Uh, I was for five years. I, for ten years I was uh, a maintenance contractor in the north and in, the, in Rotterdam. For five years a staff manager and now I'm for 10, 15 years uh, an advisor. But I'm a, they call me a free bird. I'm used as an internal advisor and I work based on projects. Um, because I want to understand the railway business and they gave me the opportunity to, to do that. The theme of the presentation, separation of transport and track, cost and earnings of transport, cost drivers of infra, and last but not least, uh, the efficiency drivers of, uh, of uh, rail transport. This is, um, in a brief overview, the world of ProRail. Uh, together with Switzerland, we have the most densely used network there are enough people in our country who, wants, who want to use the railways uh, and they pay for it. So we also earn money with passenger transport. That is our luck. We are a small country. We have uh, about 7,000 kilometers of track, uh, more than 400 stations. Punctuality is, uh, is high, 94%, and is still growing. Passengers about 1.1 million a day, freight tonnage only 0.1 million tons a day. And our value of our infrastructure, uh, 32 million billion euros. Every year, about 1.2 billion euros goes to maintenance and renewal. And uh, the train operators, they earn about 2.5 billion euros. And still, that is not enough to pay also the cost for maintenance and renewal. But I will tell you more about that. Special for ProRail, I think, is that we have outsourced everything. Engineering, maintenance, renewal, but also the logistics, the buying of materials, everything. This is an overview of the cost developments in, uh, in our country. Uh, from the early beginning of NS in 1938, even before the Second World War, and uh, what you see uh, is the development of the costs, the, uh, the, the cost per year for rail infrastructure and train operation. But uh, after 1995, the vertical line, we had a separation, and you also see that there, uh, that we, we got the, the user's charge for the, the, the train operators had to pay uh, a PSO subsidy to the train operators. But also we have, of course, the, 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 the earnings of the train operating companies and the rail infrastructure costs. Um, after 1995, it became quite clear, the, the division of costs. Uh, what is also clear is that um, uh, the infrastructure was used more intensively. 
um, uh, when you look to the, the to the nominal cost, the, 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 this this is a line for the, the the price level of 2013. It is still growing, and it's all had to do with the growth of the utilization, and that has to do with, uh, let's say, a changing situation in our country. Growth of and uh, of welfare and utilization, but. A lot has changed in uh, in that period. Um, after World War, War we, World War II, we had the rebuilding and modification, the closing of coal mines, first growth uh, uh, competition of road, uh, growth of labor costs. Don't forget that uh, fast growth of traffic jams, uh, investments in rail after the traffic jams burst, still growing. Uh, an introduction of a student card, uh, a lot of more passengers using the train, uh, more operators, uh, severe uh, safety rules, more night work. It all had influence on, let's say, those costs. Uh, the circumstances uh, were changing, uh, but there have been major cha changes in the circumstances of our company. The situation in our country is that the government has uh, a major role uh, in what we call the institutional triangle. I try to explain it. The government is the asset owner. They have paid for all the investments and they are the owner. Uh, they also give uh, concessions. Concessions to ProRail as the uh, infra, as the asset manager. Uh, and together with this concession, they give us the infra subsidy. And the infra subsidy, they said, maintain and renew it uh, uh, and deliver us a certain capacity and performance. The government also give um, uh, concessions to train operators, and we have about five for passengers on our network and about 10 uh, freight operators. And then we have contractors who have also, are also considered as train operators. And those are the asset users. And uh, about 130 million euros are given to those train operators to operate uh, low-used uh, uh, regional lines. And to close the, 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 the institutional triangle, we also have a contract relation with the train operators, a network statement, access agreement, and they pay access charges, about 270 million. In the middle, competition authority, transport safety board, like in every country, I would, I nearly would say, and that is our institutional triangle. Interesting is, it's all about passengers and shippers. Uh, there they make the earnings. And there you see a strong relationship also with our government, because the government uh, is there for the public interest. And the only reason why they give us, ProRail, uh, 1 billion euros every year is because of public interest. The government wants something. Uh, the public wants something. And we provide the rail infrastructure. And to make it complete, um, we have service providers, and uh, again, we have outsourced everything, but also the train operators. A lot of the, 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 the service provider work is outsourced by uh, the train operating companies, specialized companies. Uh, and so, in fact, we are a contract manager, uh, and we deliver capacity and performance. Vertical separation in our situation created really clear division of roles, money flows, and responsibilities. Uh, here you see the money flows, um, what goes in and goes out. And uh, there is one infra manager. manager. We have multiple uh, users of the infrastructure. Uh, we are the means of production, and they are the product. When we separated, I found it very strange that we did that, uh, because it's unlogic to do that. But I think in our situation, where the government provides the money, uh, it, 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 it worked out in our country very well. We get a subsidy, and the, the train operators, they get revenues by selling the tickets. For us, it's only cost. Uh, and the, the train operators, it's, it's all about profit. 
Uh, we deliver infra performance and life cycle cost, and uh, uh, the, the train operators transport profitability. And we have, a, I would say, a very long-term focus. Uh, the, the, the average lifetime of, of rail infrastructure is more than 50 years. And the average life, lifetime for uh, train operators, they are looking less far ahead. But you can discuss about that. Um, uh, but infra, infrastructure, average lifetime 50 years, but the bridge 100 years, more than 100 years. In this triangle, who pays decides. And when the government pays a lot of money, they also decide. They have to decide. And that's my personal vision. vision. A subsidy is commercial poison. Keep it away from the train operators. And um, I think that is the most fundamental choice that has been made by this separation. Separate those two cash flows and you get clarity in your, in your, in your company, in, your, in, in the railroads. Yeah. But again, this is our vision. Just a short question. Who, who decides the level of, of the track use charges? Just the right. excess charge, the, 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 the government. The government decides about that. And it's based on, um, uh, on a model we have developed to find out or to make clear what we consider as, uh, uh, well, how do you call it, marginal cost or, uh, uh, well, we have also another name, but I, I'll come back on it. This is the increase of utilization. It's from 1946, 1995. There we had the separation. The, uh, the blue line is uh, passenger. Uh, the, the red line is freight. And um, the, the blue line before uh, uh, the separation, the strong increase of use is the introduction of the student card. Uh, but after the separation, what you see, we still have a continuous growth for uh, passengers, but uh, a, 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 a huge increase, especially well, for our, in our situation, huge increase for freight. Punctuality increased. On the left, we had the separation in 1995, and between 1995 and 2005, it was a mess on our network. It was the, the, the separation was a fundamental change, and we couldn't deal with it. Um, it was a mess on our, on our... What you see is the punctuality. On a certain moment, it went through the 80%, less than 80% punctuality. And um, it, it illustrates, uh, let's say, a war between unions and, and uh, the, the train operators. It illustrates the uncertainties and the fight between the infra manager or the infra manager who was trying to find his role and uh, the contractors where we have outsourced the maintenance. But now we are in a stable fa phase and uh, we are completely independent from uh, NS and conti slowly, continuous, it, it, the punctuality is going up. And really this is something, this is a fight. I will show you something more about that. When you look to the technical failures, um, separation, the, 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 the failures go up with 60%. Why? Uncertainties because uh, we have outsourced maintenance and it means that about 3,000 people, railway people, went to three contractors and they didn't know what to do. And managers, they were focused not on uh, the performance, they were focused on how do we separate, how do we bring those people over to, uh, uh, to three contracting firms. Um, but the, the, the failures nowadays are slowly going down and understand the, the, the utilization is increasing. Um, full vertical separations, what we see today is it created positive optimization of uh, circumstances. We have now three views, a view of the government who wants something, a view of the, train, of the infra manager looking for, for capacity and the uh, train operators. Uh, who wants to run trains and earn money with it. We have an open debate about the best solution. We choose the best solution. 
And when it is an investment in infrastructure, there is one who decides, the government. They pay. But if it is an investment of the train operator, there is one who decides, it's the train operator. Looking a bit more in the cost, uh, those, this is the cost development of uh, rail infrastructure. Uh, well, perhaps it's a, a little bit shocking because you see they doubled. Uh, but, there is a but. Uh, separation had, I would say, a purifying effect on rail assets in financing and reporting. We have now, you could say, full transparency to the taxpayers and the train operators. On the left side, for, we, we were, for, for about 10 years, we were a part of NS, and uh, in, nine, in 2005, we were completely separated. We became an independent company. Uh, you could say that was the moment where we had full <coughs> vertical separation. Um, what, what really happened is that uh, we, 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 um, we changed our financial system. The, uh, we are now, uh, we have fully depreciation of our, uh, of our investments. So, and before that, it was based on historical cost, and today it is based on renewal cost. And it gives you a, a tremendous clear view about, let's say, the, 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 the financial situation. We are given money every year by the government to do the real uh, 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 renewals, but financially seen, this is the picture that is shown to our government. This is to the stockholders. Organization costs, they went up. Yes, of course, on the left side, you only see the asset manager's cost, but on the right side, asset management, traffic control, capacity management, and let's, let's say the board of, uh, of NS, of the board of, of ProRail. And we introduced, introduced something we call stewardship's cost, because there were a lot of costs hidden in the, in the financial system of, the, of NS. Um, for example, we are connected to our electricity network and we have to pay uh, 32 million euros every year to be connected to the main network in our country. Well, those costs are in the stewardship's cost, but also costs for taxes we have to pay. So it, it really, the, the cost for, they grew. But in fact, what you made clear were all the costs. There are no hidden costs in, in our company. I found this one interesting. Um, this is the railway business in our country, but I think it's applicable for all companies uh, in Europe. Uh, and it's a, a, a graph based on uh, uh, the realization cost on 95 lines on, in our network. And all the dots are costs. Vertical X, the euros per kilometer line per year, and the horizontal X, those are the transport units per kilometer of line. And the transport units, those are the passenger kilometers and the net ton kilometers. What you see is... Uh, the average model situation, and when I say modeled, model based on, uh, uh, on those realization dots. I try to explain what you see. I'll leave that one. And the first line you will see is the freight cost, and it, it is just a line. Uh, because they are very limited in our country. And I use it as a baseline to make clear what the passenger costs are. And this is the line for passenger cost. When you have a growth of the utilization of our network, you see the, 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 the growth in, let's say, in costs. Because you have longer trains, you have uh, faster trains, uh, you have more trains, uh, that's why the costs are growing. And those train operators, they have to pay a, a user's charge. And those are costs for uh, the, the, the train operators, but they are income for, for ProRail, for the infrastructure. So the user's charge costs, they are within 
the 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 the, 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 the uh, rail transport. Uh, it's 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 not coming money coming from outside. This is money going from train operators to the infrastructure. So the total infrastructure cost are the cost of infra in red and the cost and the, the user charge cost. Those are the total infrastructure cost. And you see how they go up. But when you have the horizontal axle, the passenger kilometers and the net on kilometers, the, the, the revenues of the train operators is a straight line. And when you have this straight line, there are two interesting points. The first one is this one. There are the cost and earnings of the train operator. They, they are in balance. And um, all on the left side, there you will find the lines necessary where you need a, a PSO subsidy. There are still the costs that are higher for, for paying the uh, uh, train operation and the user's charge. So they, you, need, you, don't, you don't earn enough money to pay the total cost for train operation. And here are the cost and income of train operation and infra management in, in balance. This is the world uh, you will find in Hong Kong and Japan. They, they have highly intensely used infrastructure. Their costs are high for infrastructure, for train operations, but their income is also very high. This explains the difference. And we are lucky uh, because most of the countries in Europe, they are on the left side of this graph. In total, the train operators in, in, in the Netherlands, uh, they are making profit. And they also make profit, enough profit, to pay the access charge. In most countries in Europe, it's not. The, 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 train, the user's charge is also paid by the government. And this is the money we receive from the government. And in this graph, well, everything above the red line, there is the government somewhere involved. It's, you don't earn enough money over there. Um, one graph, and all cost earnings for, for different parties uh, in, in the railway business in Europe in one graph. And I'm absolutely sure this, this is applicable for every country in Europe. I, I just put this one uh, in, in, in my presentation. It's, it's the same picture as you saw before, but on green, what is put on top of the earnings of the train operators are the social benefits that are part of the rail transport cost. And those social benefits, we only have calculated them for, uh, let's say, our average for the total of our network. And we have a minimum line and a maximum line of the social benefits. But in fact, you could, you could uh, calculate that for every railway line. And the social benefits of highly used, intensively used lines will be higher as for the low used re regional lines. And still a government can decide, I want to have railways. But if you want to have them, you have to pay. Cost efficiency can be measured as a ratio. Well, we talked about it. I'll show you my vision, but I'll do it briefly. Um, but always look to the two worlds. And look to, let's say, the, 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 the games and the plays in the, those worlds. It's, it's, you have cost and earnings, but you also have a PSO subsidy. All in red is paid by the government. And the excess charge, it, it goes out from train operation. It goes in by rail infrastructure. It's, it's, it's a play, and don't forget that. It, it, it's a mix of, 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 of streams, of cash flows. And that makes it not always, that makes it not very clear. Um, well, here you, you, you see uh, uh, the, the same as above, but then with, with, with figures. I don't think it's of real interest now to, to go into the figures, but you can, if you only look at money, what comes in and goes out, you can see, you can make ratios. But the most interesting, personally, I find, bring all the, the red figures together that are paid by the government and, and the other ones that are paid and earned by the train operators. That's, for Europe, I think that is really significant. And there are a lot of, a lot of hidden 
financial streams in, in our companies in Europe. Uh, bring them together, one overview, and it will give you a f much more clear view on the business, how it really is run in, in Europe. Um, rail infrastructure cost. We'll go in, in depth. <laughs> we'll go to, to let's say, my, my company, ProRail. Uh, years ago, I made this graph uh, together with Heine Bente. Um, the, the, this is a cost ratio, cost index, uh, in, the, in green in Holland, I said that's 100. In the United States, the, I found out, we found out, that the rail infrastructure costs in the United States are only 20% of those in, uh, in Holland. But when you go to Japan, uh, if, even Hong Kong, it's, it's uh, three times as high in our country. Excuse and me, is, is that per per kilometer, kilometer, per track kilometer, per, uh, track kilometer, per kilometer of main track? And um, I have visited all those uh, countries, all the all the, and when I was there, you found railway people, and I found I I recognize it everywhere, everywhere. So it, there was not something hidden, something strange or different. No, it, it, I, I could understand what I saw, but the difference I could not explain. Um, and I, but slowly I started to understand uh, what was behind it, and I will explain you uh, how we did it. Look at this. How is the infrastructure used? Uh, on the left, and th that's very simple. I, when, I, I, perhaps you would use other, other, other figures, but very long trains with a lot of uh, tons in it. Uh, many lines with only one track. Uh, it means no switches, f far less uh, signals. Uh, uh, f a few trains a day. We look to our network, more than 200 trains a day on two tracks or even more, 70 to 1,000 to tons per train, 40 to 600 meter long trains. That's the difference. <laughs> um, but behind this difference is the word complexity. Utilization is different, tons, train kilometers, and complexity. Train operating cost per line differs substantially because of differences in train length, in type, and intensity. A regional line is completely different from the intercity. On our inter intercity network, we have the double-deckers, uh, uh, four trains an hour per direction, uh, 140 kilometers or, or faster, uh, a, a train driver and several conductors. While in the regional trains, you have, they are small. Very often only one train driver, one or two trains per hour per direction, and freight is, is, has a very typical characteristic. When you look to the infrastructure cost, per, uh, they differ substantially because of difference for two drivers, utilization and complexity. Here you see on the left, that's a regional line in Holland, but it could be a line, a heavy haul freight line in the United States. Our line, network intercity mainland line, is far more complex as the, the freight network in the United States. That explains the difference in cost. That's annual cost. The? That was annual cost. Annual cost, yes. Including renewals? Including renewals, overhead, uh, everything, yeah. Yeah. total. Yeah. Yeah. Average lifetime cost. Yes. Based on benchmark uh, information, based on, uh, uh, on cost information in our country, um, I developed this model. Um, I try to explain it, but those are what you see is, are the, uh, the, the maintenance cost of our network. Or horizontal acts, uh, the fictive day tonnage, but you also can take year tonnage, but it, those are tons. And on the vertical acts, those are the cost, uh, it is a cost index, but in fact it, it are the, the, the cost per kilometer uh, of main track. And uh, when you look very closely in the middle, you see a green dot uh, on, on 100. Those are the average maintenance costs on the average utilization on our network.
There are a few interesting cost drivers. This is the average situation, as I mentioned. The height is completely related to the complexity of our network. How many switches do we have? How many kilometers of main track? Uh, how many signals? Uh, do we have catenary, yes or no? The horizontal axis, as I told you, is the utilization. And on top, the, 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 the lines, those are the lines related to the percentage of day and night work and the effective working time. On the left, you have an effective word far on the left. When you have low use lines, you can work for eight hours. And you can do it by daylight. But when you, get, when you have a growing use of, uh, of your, your network, you are forced to work at night. And the, the longest period we can work in, on our network is four hours. But we have to pay eight hours. You understand what we influence is in the United States. I have I've talked with them. I've, I've, I, I know that a lot of their maintenance work and renewal, even renewal work, is done at daylight. That explains a lot. <coughs> Here you see the explanation of the big cost, cost gap between the United States and the Netherlands. It, it's, it is because of a difference in utilization and complexity. No catenary, far less switches, less signals, less day of, uh, more day work, uh, more effective working times, and ton kilometers in, 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 instead of train kilometers. And what, what I actually did, uh, the model I, I have shown you before, uh, uh, that's a model that explains the, the, the maintenance cost on our, on our uh, lines, and um, we have 39 contracts, and with the model, we, we can explain, we can calculate the cost for every contract, for every maintenance contract. And the model has a, a, a high reliability, uh, a very high reliability. And what we did is uh, I took the model, and I put in the model the situation as if uh, we had the, the, the situation in the, in the United States. The amount of switches, uh, no, uh, no catenary, the, 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 the amount of signals. And what I found were the differences. What would be the cost in our country when we had the situation as if it is the United States? And I found this explanation. For 70%, I could explain the, 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 the cost gap of 80% between the Netherlands and the United States. Well, that's not bad, I would say. And when I've, I, I, I saw this, I really understood what the real cost drivers are. Complexity, 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 and utilization. And absolutely, there are differences in quality. And uh, I, I say the operational excellence, the way they manage in the United States, uh, the, we, we, we have learned from them and still are able to learn from them. But that is the major part are utilization and complexity. What's behind it? That's where we, what we were trying to find out. Maximizing assets efficiency depends on the skills and quality of the organization. I will explain that. For, for rail infrastructure, it's all about one thing, performance, only performance. That's the only thing of interest for, for train operators. And of course, you need money. But why do you need money? You only have to deliver performance. Well, if you don't have money, um, you you, you, you can't create that. Why can't you create that? There are risks. If you use infrastructure, you create risks. Um, and what do you do? You have to manage those risks. The, the, the tear and wear of your infrastructure to keep up the performance, you, you keep that, uh, you manage that with activities. You do maintenance work and renewal works to manage risks related to the performance. And it's a pity, but activities, they cost money. You have to pay for it. And the amount of money you have to pay for the activities to control risk depends on the conditions. And the conditions, what do I mean with the conditions? 
the amount of uh, uh, the complexity of your infrastructure, the amount of switches, the amount of signals. If you have more switches, you have to do more activities to control the risk on all those switches. It's very simple. If you have a higher utilization, you have to control the, the, the higher tear and wear of your infrastructure. This simple overview, that's the world of an asset manager. It's as simple as that. There is one problem, um, and the problem is that um, this is not the, the, the world of the asset manager. The asset manager, the world of an asset manager is dictated by the circumstances. When you look to the circumstances, the surrounding, the history of a country, the, 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 the policy, the, the unions, they have an influence on what is happening in this triangle. When I talk to people in France or in Germany or in Sweden, with people who understand the railways, we talk about those triangles, the cost, performance, condition and activities, and we understand each other. But what comes out of our companies, they differ because the circumstances, they are different. They are influenced from the outside. It's not because uh, there are bad engineers in, in, in France that they don't do it as well as, 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 as Switzerland or, or other countries. No, it has to do with the circumstances. That's something I strongly believe, and I think we have discussed that already yesterday. Managers, boards, they are looking only at cost and performance, but the only way you can influence it is on the vertical uh, line, conditions and activities. And boards, they don't understand anything about that. They are only looking at cost, cost, performance, perhaps, perhaps. But they forget that if they want to influence it, if you want to create it, you have to look you have to be in control of the conditions and the activities. You have to relate that to, uh, to, to the risks. And risk, that is the connection between, I would say, a board and people who are, are really influencing, are doing the work. The risks is the, is the new language in our, uh, in our branch, I would say. Risk brings us together. Performance improved after separation because we get a much better focus on the clients, continuous improvement and cooperation. I'll give you an example of it. An example is that we have now a performance analysis bureau. Uh, it's a part of ProRail uh, traffic control, uh, an independent knowledge center for the whole branch. They provide all kinds of train process information, feedback loop from plan and realization of the train process practical train process knowledge and development and improvement of information system. And what they measure is punctuality, punctuality, trains, 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 and trying to understand the mechanisms behind uh, uh, the interaction between infrastructure, uh, capacity, trains. And um, the reason why the punctuality nowadays goes up step by step is because of them. They're making small adjustments, very small uh, improvements and those very small improvements they, they lead to 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 uh, on a certain spots certain train series to small improvements of punctuality but in total it's going up and I'm absolutely sure this is going to continue and we we are going we, we are going to improve this 94 percent we know how it goes Another one, and I'm nearly at the end of the presentation, is uh, the cost-performance ratio also improves when the whole system de uh, is decomplicated. On the right, you see the situation in Tokyo. On the left, you see the situation in Utrecht today. Yeah, you see the difference. I, <laughs> when I look to, the, to your reaction. Um, 180 trains per hour in Tokyo, and they only need 28 switches. Interesting, isn't it? Um, we had the philosophy in the past that a train coming in Utrecht would, should, would enter every platform. From any direction, it, it would, have, would, would have to, uh, the possibility to, to go to any platform. We stopped that. We are now changing this philosophy. We, we decomplex 
uh, Utrecht. And that's a huge operation, I can tell you. We go from 200 switches in the main track, we have more switches in Utrecht, but 200 in the main track to 60 switches. Behind every switch you have signals. Behind every signal you have train operators. We go from field 14 to 16 platforms, okay. We go to 90 trains an hour, but we know that we have more capacity in Utrecht while we have less complex infrastructure. This is the way uh, we earn money. This is the way we know as an infrastructure manager that the cost will decrease and the, uh, the, the performance will increase. Um, 10, 20 years ago, we also said uh, to the train operator, then it was our boss, NS, we should reduce the amount of switches. They didn't want to do it. They want to stick to those switches. They want to keep them because they didn't have to pay for it. After we separated, we again came back to our government and we showed it. And there was, there was not a fight but there, was, there were two visions. The vision of the train operator, stick to the, 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 the switches, and the vision of us, of ProRail. This could be a solution. Look at how they had done it in, in, in Japan. And the government, people from the government, went over to Japan, and they had a look together with people from NS and from ProRail, and they had a combined look. And after they came back, they were convinced, this is our future. We have to do it. We are a little bit anxious to do it, but we'll do it. Yes, it's an interesting sheet, but performance increases and costs go down when the system is decomplicated. Look at the United States. Look at Japan. Look at Hong Kong. Conclusions? Well, this will take a long time. <laughs> Railways in Europe can't exist without government financing. Everybody knows that. Full vertical separation created in Holland, in the Netherlands, beneficial circumstances as a result of well-separated roles, money flows and responsibilities. Full separation created positive optimization circumstances. Three roles with three different look at rail infrastructure, at, at, at the railways, I would say. Role fulfillment of the government and cooperation, they are decisive. Look at the situation in Europe where the government really plays a role. There you see the differences. Earnings and cost ratios are high level indicators for efficiency, can be. Usage and complexity are the main rail infrastructure cost drivers, as you have seen, and risk management is the key to optimize cost and performance of rail infrastructure. Skills, conditions, circumstances, and price, price of a ticket, they determine the efficiency or inefficiency of railways. And last but not least, our ambition is to be the best infra manager in Europe, and we want to be leading in the world. And best infra manager, we consider Switzerland as the best. Up till now, <laughs> but who knows? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>